All right, well, this morning we're back. Well, actually, we didn't leave Luke's gospel. We just sort of fast-forwarded ahead to the, um, the resurrection, crucifixion and resurrection. But now we're coming back uh, to Luke chapter 8 to pick up where we left off. And this morning, the, as I read this, there's actually uh, several things that are here. But, uh, but again, I, I'm just going to deal with what it is I've told you I'm going to be dealing with, which is the, uh, the parable of the sower. And more particularly, the, um, just the results of the seed in each of the soils and what those represent. Because our Lord is really, uh, he's telling his, his disciples what they can expect as they evangelize. And certainly we'll, we'll want to think about it from that perspective, uh, perhaps at a later time. But those four different soils talk about four possible responses to the, the, to the gospel and um, to, to God's truth in general. And I think the Lord would have us to examine our own lives uh, by these different possibilities to see uh, where we are with, with Him. So let's uh, just begin by reading the text. And uh, I am, I'm not going to deal with the first three verses at all, but I will come back to that uh, probably next week. But let's read the first 15 verses. Now, soon afterwards, He began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. When a large crowd was coming together, and, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, He spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up, and produced a crop a hundred times as great. And as he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand." Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns... These are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Well, again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, two, I think, of the most important questions that we will ever ask in life are are certainly these. How can I be saved? And am I a true believer? Have I been saved? Now, hopefully, we all know the answer to the first. The answer to the first question, you know, how can I be saved, is, is what Paul and Silas said to the Philippian jailer. Remember when they were put in prison and that earthquake took place and it opened all the cells and their bonds fell off and the Philippian jailer came trembling into the cell and he asked that very question and they answered him this, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's really quite simple. If we are to enter into heaven, we do have to come through the only door which the Father has provided. There's only one way. Christianity is exclusive. Uh, God would not, the Father, send His Son to go through all of this, only to let somebody come in some other way. We have to come through Jesus. And to do that, we must be willing to turn from our sins, 
trust and rely upon Jesus and what he has done alone for our acceptance with God, and then follow him for the rest of our lives. Jesus is the only way. Now, I just wanted to pause for a minute and just repeat something I've already said, and that is to remind us of what a great privilege it is to know the answer to this question. I mean, especially in light of what we're going to be looking at, because this is talking about evangelism, right? So few people in the world, uh, you know, uh, percentage-wise, uh, actually know the gospel. We cannot be saved without trusting in Jesus. But Paul reminds us, we never would have trusted him if we didn't first hear about him, if we didn't first know about him, nor can anybody else which is why it's such a great privilege not only to know the gospel, but also to be those commissioned by the Lord to share the gospel. Paul writes this in Romans 10, verses 13 through 15. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. You know, we don't want to think that God just saves people, you know, who haven't heard the gospel in other ways. If we do that, then we're, first of all, of course, negating what Paul says here. They have to hear. They have to hear Jesus, and the only way they can hear him is as his gospel is shared. But the only way it's shared is if somebody actually goes there to share it. Well, the Lord has shared it with us. He's entrusted us with this treasure, and he wants us to give it to others. Remember what Jesus says in Acts 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And it's certainly true in this case. So that's how we are saved. But let's not forget about the second question. Am I a true believer? Am I actually saved? Well, how can we know? Uh, is it what many churches believe today? Um, and certainly I can say this because I was in one of these churches and the college I went to certainly believe this. That all you really need to do is pray the sinner's prayer. And if you pray the sinner's prayer and you're sincere, then you're saved. Well, of course, if you were truly sincere, you would be saved if you prayed in faith, right? But if you walk away, never come back to church, never serve the Lord, oh, well, you're not saved because those who are saved as we're going to see, bear fruit. Is it enough then to believe that we're saved and to join with the church and at least look like a Christian? Well, no, that isn't enough either. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on to say in verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Basically, you who practice lawlessness. Remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, that you can have miraculous gifts. These people prophesied, they perform any miracles. Jesus didn't question whether they had done this or not. It really wasn't a matter of the supernatural gifts. It was a matter of how they were living. Now, the Lord certainly knows whether or not we belong to Him, and on the day of judgment, it'll be quite clear. But how can we know now while we can still do something about our condition if we should find out that we're really not in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, as I've already mentioned, Jesus tells us several things in our passage this morning. Uh, several things even uh, including this. He tells us what he uses to bring people to himself. He does tell us something that's very difficult to hear, and perhaps you caught on as I was reading through this passage, that this privilege of, of this uh, basically salvation is not something that is necessarily granted to everyone. Okay, We're going to have to come back to that one because that's a little bit more involved. But he also tells us something that we need to focus on this morning, and it's this, that his salvation changes the life. We will not be what we were before. Now, this morning, that's the point we want to look at. 
Jesus in our parable here gives us four possible responses to the gospel, but only one of them actually represents salvation. Yeah, I think I've already proven that point, but we will look at that a little bit more as we go along. So this isn't talking about, again, one person that isn't saved and then three possibilities of those who are saved. There are three that aren't and only one that is. So what I want us to do is, first of all, look at the four responses to try to understand what Jesus is saying here. Now, the first thing is Jesus is using a parable, obviously. And remember that a parable is a story that where the, you know, the one who's speaking uses things that are familiar in order to describe things that are unfamiliar. So using worldly things in order to describe heavenly things. That's what Jesus is doing. And here he's using the very familiar image. That, again, Jews lived in an agricultural society. They knew what farmers did. He uses the image of a farmer sowing his field to illustrate evangelism and the results of evangelism or the effect that it's going to have on those who hear. Now, in this parable, the farmer or the one who sows is the evangelist, obviously. He's the one bringing the good news. Jesus is certainly referring to himself. He's the one who is sowing the seed. He's certainly referring to his disciples because he is training them also to go out and to share the gospel. As a matter of fact, just a couple chapters away, he's going to send them on their first uh, mission, well, missionary or preaching tour as they become itinerant preachers, you know, going from town and town to village to village um, to bring the gospel. And Jesus here is also referring to us because he has also called us to be those who would evangelize this present generation. Now, all of us don't have you know, again, the, the call to be full-time evangelists, but all of us are to be sowing seed wherever we go. Now, the seed is the Word of God, or more specifically, it, it is uh, the gospel. What Jesus has done to save and what it is we must do to receive what it is He has done. Uh, the field is the land of Israel. Jesus was sowing the seed in Israel at that time, Palestine. Uh, the gospel, remember, was to the Jew first, but now the field is the whole world. Remember, Jesus in the Great Commission sends his disciples out to the entire world. And the four soils, the hard soil, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, and the good soil. And how the seed performs in each one of these represents the four possible responses based on four possible heart conditions. Now, I think we need to see that last point. It's based upon the condition of the heart, and that's something that really is in God's hands. We don't have any control over that, but the Lord does. So what do these four types of soil mean? Well, in the first, Jesus tells us that there was seed that fell beside the road, and really that preposition in, in the Greek can mean along the road. I think the seed is not just falling in a ditch beside the road, but it's, it's sort of as he's scattering the seeds, some of it is falling along the road or on the road, uh, which is then trampled underfoot and then eaten by birds. Now, I think you know when you trample on ground, uh, the ground becomes relatively hard. Uh, usually, you know, you, you plow up the field before you sow the seed because you want the seed to penetrate. If it has a hard surface, the seed doesn't penetrate. If it doesn't penetrate, it's not going to germinate. It's not going to grow. It's not going to produce any fruit. And that's what happens in this case. Jesus says in verse 12, those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so they will not believe and be saved. Now, I do think the hard ground represents a hard heart. It represents the kind of heart that we all had when we came into the world, which is referred to in the Bible as a stony heart, okay, as an uncircumcised heart, which means that it's a heart that is basically unmoved by God, one that hates Him, one that is at war with Him. And again, that's our condition as we come into the world, and sometimes we don't we don't know that it is because we don't really feel that animosity towards the Lord. We don't think we ever hated the Lord that, like that, but that's only because God restrains the sin that's inside of our hearts. And sometimes when He exposes us 
to the truth shines a light in our eyes, that's when we begin to see how much dislike we have uh, for the Word. Now, in that condition, there's no way that we would have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would have trusted Him. Uh, when the, the Word is offered to us, we, we refused it, and many of us actually did refuse it when it was first presented to us. The gospel didn't penetrate, didn't penetrate the heart. And so the devil came, and he took God's word from us so that we would not remember probably by just getting us wrapped up in the world or, or something else. So in the first case, notice no penetration of the seed, no germination, no growth, no fruit. I think we all agree the first one uh, represents an unconverted person. Now in the second one, the seed fell on rocky soil. This is referring to the kind of situation where you have very... A uh, very thin layer of, um, of soil on top. The soil is very shallow, and you have basically bedrock that's underneath. Now, in this case, the seed penetrated and it germinated, but when the roots went down, they hit the rock, and because the plant couldn't grow downwards, all the growth basically went upwards. And the result was that the plants grew up quickly, and they, they looked, wow, these look like great plants, very healthy. They're growing very quickly. They look very promising. But as soon as things heated up a bit, you know, the sun comes out, the plants withered because they didn't have any deep roots from which to draw water, and so they died. And notice they didn't produce any fruit. Now, Jesus says in verse 13, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root they believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. Now notice the gospel had some effect, okay? They heard it, they believed it, they received it, even joyfully received it. They thought they were saved. Don't have to face God's judgment anymore, now I can go to heaven. I think the idea here is mainly I don't have to face the punishment because unbelievers really don't want to go to heaven it's possible that such a person actually joined with a local fellowship and maybe continued to worship the Lord for a while and looked very promising. But as soon as a trial came, and that's what this word temptation means, some persecution, some difficulty for following Jesus, right? Uh, something they had to give up they didn't want to give up, that if they're going to continue to follow Jesus, maybe their lives, right? Well, what happens? They fall away. Now, we do need to recognize that there are people in the church who may profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who really don't know Him, and so they eventually fall away. John writes in 1 John 2, verse 19, they went out from us, but they were, really, they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. Now, it's many words to say that there were some people who left the church because they really didn't believe, right? So not everybody who professes to be a Christian necessarily is a Christian. As a matter of fact, it's been my experience, just from observation over the years, and I've had a few years to, to look at things, that those who seem to just sort of take off and soar when they first seemingly come to Jesus are usually the ones who are the first to crash and burn. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, okay? But that happens because they really don't know Him. A true believer's growth is most often slow and steady. Now, there are exceptions. The Apostle Paul was certainly an exception. But typically, Christians are more like the tortoise than the hare in Aesop's fable. You know, slow and steady wins the race. Okay, we don't just, we're not like shooting stars like skyrockets that go up and explode. You know, we, we're more, just make more slow progress and we keep going as we're going to see again in the fourth. But notice again here, no fruit. Okay, no fruit. Now in the third, the seed falls among the thorns and the thorns grow up with the seed and choke it out so that it doesn't produce any fruit, doesn't bring any fruit to maturity. And Jesus explains that in verse 14. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit 
to maturity. Now again, here we have a situation where those who seem to believe and receive the gospel, and they even continue for a while, but there's something that stops them from actually getting down to serving the Lord. They're divided, and they're divided by certain things here. Worries. Maybe it's the worry that um, my needs aren't going to be met. I'm not going to have what I need in retirement, so I've got to amass this, this wealth. And, you know, they forget what Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 6, where he says, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added to you. Now, he's not saying we don't need to be concerned about taking care of our needs, but we can be overly concerned. And then he also adds the desire for the things of the world, wealth, honor, pleasures, the things you can see now versus the things that really have to be seen by faith. Jonathan Edwards um, said this on one occasion. He said that pleasure that is near has much more, much more power over us, as it were, than pleasures that are far away. And if you're looking at the world and all it has to offer right now, that's much more tempting. It can be much more tempting than thinking about the hereafter, which may seem like it's a, a long ways away. But if you have true faith, then you will count those greater riches and you'll give up what it is that you might otherwise gain in this world. But you see, the desire for these things draws them into the world and because they're divided, they're never really able to get serious about serving the Lord and they don't produce any fruit. They don't bring any fruit to maturity. Now, at this point, if you haven't asked this question, you, you, you certainly should. If it is true that everyone's heart that comes into the world is, remember how David describes himself in Psalm 51? He was conceived in iniquity and sin. His mother conceived him, born in iniquity and so forth. And what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, that there's no one who seeks after God and that our hearts are basically dark and evil and so forth. If this is the way we come into the world like that represented by the hard soil in the first example, then why does the seed really have any effect on soils two and three, on the rocky ground and on the thorny ground? Well, we need to recognize that the, the Spirit works in more than one way. He doesn't work just to convert people. Jesus said He would send Him into the world in order to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. The Spirit of God can work on the conscience to make us concerned about the state of our souls, to make us even believe that we're in danger. And if we kind of go through the motions, He doesn't make us believe that we're saved, but if we think that we've trusted in Jesus, we might actually believe that we are trusting in Jesus and that we are actually saved. So the Spirit of God can awaken us. That's what's called awakening. Uh, you've heard of the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and those that ministered during that time. It was the Great Awakening. It was not the great conversion. Even though there were many more people converted during that time, it was that the society was awakened to their need. And sometimes the Spirit of God works so powerfully that that person who is so thoroughly awakened looks like a believer, believes himself to be a believer, but eventually shows himself not to be a believer, although John Calvin did mention that perhaps the greatest example of this is the person who actually perseveres through his entire life in the church and never apostatizes, okay? So that can happen too, which is why we need to examine our hearts to make sure that, you know, we, don't, we have more than that, that we have more than just the awakening of the Holy Spirit. So the real question is, how can we tell the difference between that work of awakening and the Spirit's saving work? And I think that's what the fourth soil tells us. Now here, the seed fell into good soil. It germinated. It bore fruit. A hundred times as much. Okay, here's the one soil where there's actually some fruit. Jesus then gives us this commentary in verse 15. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Now, again, I'll draw your attention to the condition of the heart here. Honest and good. Receives the word, holds it fast, bears fruit. It's been prepared by the Spirit. Remember what Jesus said as he uh, would, was basically preaching that parable. 
He says, uh, Luke says he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. These are the ones who have heard, okay? And you only hear by the work of the Holy Spirit. So here's one thing. Now, if he has done this for us, this is what we should expect to see. That we don't basically just hear the sound waves bombarding our, our eardrums and, and recognize somebody said something, but we actually listen, you know, to what Jesus says. We receive what he says. We hold on to what he says. We do what he says. We bear fruit consistently. We persevere in bearing fruit. The kind of fruit that uh, we read about, the fruit of the Spirit in our meditation, which is primarily love, but also what that love produces. And, and what does it produce? Obedience. Obedience to the law. And why does the love of the Spirit produce obedience to the law of God? Because remember what Paul was, was commenting to the Romans about on one occasion, all that is in the law is fulfilled by one thing. It's fulfilled by love. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, and certainly love gives to God what belongs to God. The greatest commandment is what? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the fulfillment of the law. If the Spirit of God gives you love, He's given you the desire to do what the law of God actually says, the Ten Commandments. You'll want to keep those. You're not saved by keeping them, but if you were saved, you will keep them because you love them, because basically it's the definition of love. So that's what the fourth soil looks like, and this is true conversion. Now, how can we know that this fourth soil is the only one that represents true conversion? Well, it all boils down to fruit. Remember, fruit. It's the only one that bears fruit. Jesus says all true believers will bear fruit. Going back to a passage we quoted earlier, which I didn't complete, in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. He bears fruit. He does the Father's will. What is that will? Explained in the Ten Commandments. He obeys the commandments out of love for God. Jesus says in, in what I read earlier in our uh, reading of Scripture in John 15, verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you're apart from Jesus, you do nothing. That's what those first three soils bore was nothing, right? Seed didn't penetrate. Seed didn't, you know, the plant withered, didn't bring any fruit. The, the, the seed was choked, didn't bring any fruit to maturity. The fourth one, there's fruit. Jesus says, he who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. And what happens to those branches that don't bear fruit? They get pruned off, men gather them, they cast them into the fire. False professions end up, in the end, being condemned. And then John writes this in 1 John 3, verses 7 and 8. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous, that is Jesus. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Now, taking that in the context, what he's saying is that he came to destroy the works of the devil in us by breaking the power of sin and giving us the ability to practice righteousness. And that's what it means to bear fruit. Because what, what is the, the um, standard of righteousness? The law of God, which is the law of love. And then, of course, that very familiar passage by James in James 2.26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So if we say we believe but we're not producing works, and that's fruit, works of love, obedience to the law of God. We have a dead faith, and can that faith save us? No, it can't. There are people who say that dead faith can save you, dead faith can't save you. You have to have a living faith, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That comes, again, by the Spirit of God. So getting back to our original question, how can we know that we are true believers? 
that, that we're really saved and that we're not basically hard, you know, hard soil hearers. We're not rocky soil hearers. We're not thorny ground hearers. Well, we can only know if we have received God's Word, if we receive the gospel in an honest and good heart. In other words, we received it because we want it, because we love it, because we love Him. We can know if we're holding it fast and bearing fruit with perseverance. This is just another way of saying if we're trusting in Jesus and turning away from our sins and following Him as He directs us in the Word. So Jesus, first of all, would have us step back this morning and, and basically take a good look at ourselves and ask, what is it that we see when we, when we look at ourselves? You know? Now, we're going to see a lot of yuck. You know, there was, um, the, the, we were warned by, by certain branches of the church that we ought to be very careful when we look at our hearts and we look at our lives because the problem is even true believers are going to find a lot of sin you know, that, that is in our hearts. So remember, it's not a question of whether we see any sin in our hearts. That's not the question we're asking. The question is, what do we see with regard to the good things? Do we see His grace there? Do we see that acceptance of Christ, that love for Him, and these other fruits that we would see go along with this, doing what the Lord calls us to do? Well, if that's what we see, then we do belong to Him. And if we do belong to Him, it's really only because of His grace. It's not because we were good enough, not because we worked our way into it. It's because the Lord had mercy upon us. We trusted Jesus. We've been clothed with Christ, forgiven by Him, and accepted in Him. And it's His Spirit working in us that actually produces these good works, that, that evidence. But if we step back and we look at ourselves, and that isn't what we see, we don't see this, but instead we see basically we're closer to one of the other soils. And by the way, I should mention this too. Um, we can also fall into that thorny ground kind of a situation. It's not that those in the fourth category aren't tempted by the world or the worries of the world. It's just that those things don't overcome them and choke the word so it produces no fruit. But you see, if you are characterized by any of those first three and there is no fruit in your life, then you need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We do need to remember the, and I have to say this guardedly because Ken Ham is going to say something this evening which almost sounds like it contradicts this, but it doesn't. The condition of, of the soil of our hearts doesn't really depend on what we do in a certain sense. I mean, it is true that we're responsible for the hard ground. Um, that's true, and that does depend on us. We have hardened our hearts against God. But this kind of soil can really only come about by the Holy Spirit. And I'll just mention, Ken Ham also talks about means. When he talks about Acts 2 and Acts 17, you know, and how we should approach unbelievers, uh, what's the difference? The difference is Acts 2 Jews have a foundation in the Bible, okay? Acts 17, Gentiles don't, okay? So there are certain things we need to do to try to lay a foundation. We call that pre-evangelism. You know, we need to help them understand that this other religion is not true, but the Bible is true, okay? So we try to convince them intellectually, but ultimately it's going to be the Holy Spirit that changes the heart, that produces this kind of soil. He's the one who can make the heart, the hard heart, soft, He's the one who can make the soil deep. He's the one who basically can weed the garden of our hearts and take away our love for this world by giving us a greater love for God and His kingdom. He does that by His Holy Spirit. So if you find this morning that you're not trusting in Jesus, this is really where you need to begin. You need to ask Him to send His Holy Spirit. You know, the Puritan, during the Puritan era, the, the way they would evangelize is they preached the gospel Repent and believe. But then someone might come up to them and say, I know I need to repent and believe, but I really don't want to repent and believe, but I know I'm in danger of, of going into God's judgment if I don't, so what can I do? Well, you can just continue to say repent and believe, repent and believe, and hope somehow that's going to get them to be able to do it. But that's not what the Puritans said. The Puritans said, seek the Lord while he may be found. Ask him for his Holy Spirit. And perhaps in God's grace, He'll grant that Spirit to you. Again, it's sovereignly His hands, but you need the Spirit. And He's the only one who can give the Holy Spirit, so you need to ask Jesus for His Spirit. And if you seek Him, 
there is, again, uh, as Jonathan Edwards pointed, um, God is a merciful God. If you don't seek him, you will certainly perish. But if you seek him, he may be found of you. So seek him while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near to change your heart and to give you the ability to trust and obey. Well, let's uh, bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to apply his word as we need to hear it this morning.